webinar is titled The Ins and Outs of Radical Prostatectomy, and today's guest speaker is Dr. Peter Black, urologic oncologist at Vancouver General Hospital, research scientist at the Vancouver Prostate Centre, and professor at the University of British Columbia. And without further ado, I will now turn this webinar over to Dr. Black. Thank you, Dr. Black. Well, hello. Um, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to, today to have the opportunity to uh, speak a little bit about some of the details around radical prostatectomy. Um, I'm going to go right to my next slide. What I do not want to speak about is the comparison between surgery and radiation and other treatment options. I think that's a topic for another day, another time. Um, but I want to focus in on some of the details around surgery. Uh, so I've broken it down into three broad areas. I'll talk a little bit about the, the who, what, how of radical prostatectomy. We'll talk a little bit about the post-operative period after surgery, and then I'll also talk about additional therapies that can be offered after prostatectomy. So first of all, the, the what, the how, and the who of radical prostatectomy. So we seem to spend an inordinate amount of time talking about surgery of the prostate, much more than we do with many other treatments. And I think the, the real problem here is just the location of the prostate in the center of the pelvis. So men won't necessarily miss the prostate when we remove it surgically. It doesn't have important func functions itself. But removal of the prostate risks uh, putting other structures uh, or damaging other structures and putting quality of life at risk. So especially bladder function, sexual function, and, and occasionally bowel function can be affected. This is made a little bit more complicated uh, for the patient from a, a decision-making point of view because there are so many choices for treatment of localized prostate cancer. And we're also faced with the dilemma of, you know, do we really need to treat in some of the patients with lower risk disease? Uh, so it's, it's a difficult decision for patients to decide how they want to be treated. This picture shows the anatomy uh, of the prostate. You can see the prostate sitting right in the center of the pelvis here. It's, it's lying on the pelvic floor almost like a, like a hammock below. It's right in front of the rectum and it really is, is continuous with the bladder neck. Uh, this means that especially bladder, bladder function emptying uh, can be affected. Uh, there are nerves coming by here in faint yellow that affect sexual function. They go to the penis and then the rectum, of course, is very close by. You'll notice all, also these little rabbit ears going off the top, the seminal vesicles. They will also come out uh, at the time of surgery. This shows the same anatomy looking at it from the side. So we have the bladder is here on the right-hand side of the image. The purple in the middle is the prostate. And then the urethra actually goes right through the prostate and, and out towards the penis. You can see in, in blue at the top, uh, there's a very rich blood supply around the prostate. So historically, blood loss has always been a, a concern with prostatectomy, although not so much anymore. And then at the back in yellow, we have these nerve fibers again. They come from way behind, close to the rectum. They come up right past the prostate and towards the penis. And they really are embedded in the prostate. And so a big part of surgery can be whether we can spare those nerves or not. The question is why do we call it radical prostatectomy? And we, we call it radical prostatectomy to distinguish it from, from other kinds of prostatectomy. So on the left, we have a transurethral resection of the prostate where we go in with a camera and we scrape off chips of prostate to open up the channel for benign enlargement. And on the right, we have another an open procedure called a simple prostatectomy where we actually go through the abdominal wall, through the bladder, and then pull out the main central part of the prostate, which again is the benign and large part um, that can obstruct urine flow. But you see it does leave a rim of normal prostate uh, behind, so it's not considered radical. The radical prostatectomy includes removal of the entire prostate. So we come across here between prostate and urethra and across here between bladder and prostate. And we, these would be the nerves at the back, which we try to spare. And then we have to sew the bladder neck back to the urethra just to close that gap. And the specimen comes out uh, looking like this with the seminal vesicles, as I mentioned, hanging off the top here. And this is the entire prostate that comes out. Who can have a radical prostatectomy? Well, in general, all men with intermediate or high risk 
uh, prostate cancer can be considered for prostatectomy if, if they don't have any spread of the cancer, and especially if they don't have any major health reasons that would prevent them um, from or make it unnecessary to treat the prostate cancer. If, if a patient has medical conditions that make anesthesia a high risk, well, often those patients don't really need treatment of the prostate cancer either because it's unlikely to affect them during their lifetime. But, but certainly there are cases um, where we might say they, that uh, radiation would be better because of the anesthetic risk or other special circumstances. For example, a, a severe pelvic fracture might make surgery very difficult. Uh, so it's always an individual uh, decision. Once the patient's decided on surgery, of course, that's not the end of the decision making. Unfortunately, the further dilemma for the patient is always, uh, do I have it done open? Do I have it done robotically or laparoscopic? And I think these are, the differences are, are really subtle between the different uh, modalities. I don't think that a patient should get lost uh, in the details of this. The, um, the open surgery is a very refined surgery. Uh, and there's, you know, there's nothing old about it just because it's open. The laparoscopic surgery has the advantages of making it minimally invasive, uh, but it is quite a difficult surgery, and, and most urologists um, do not do it routinely. And then the robot uh, makes the laparoscopy easier again with technologic advances, makes it an easier surgery, but it's very expensive, so it adds a lot of cost to the procedure. Patients often ask, well, what can I do to prepare for surgery now that I've, I've decided I'm going to go for radical prostatectomy? What can I contribute? I think there are a few things to think about. One is um, if, if a patient smokes, then, then certainly should try to quit smoking before surgery. That will reduce the risk of complications around the time of surgery. Patients should try and eat well, and, and you know, eating well can mean a lot of different things. But in general, a diet that is heart healthy is also good for, uh, for the prostate and for recovery after surgery. If a patient is diabetic, then controlling blood sugars is important. Uh, complication rates increase with poor sugar control. And then exercise is perhaps the most important thing. Uh, you can think of surgery as, as being like a marathon, and training, training for the, the surgery will enhance recovery and the patient experience. So let's uh, move to the post-operative uh, recovery after radical prostatectomy. So surgery will typically take about uh, two to four hours in the operating room. Uh, there's no, there should be no pride in being fast. It doesn't matter how fast this is. It's more, more important that it's done carefully. Uh, so it doesn't matter if it takes a little bit longer. We, we at our center uh, get most patients home the next day, so a day after surgery. But it depends a lot on the hospital and the surgeon, and, and certainly it can be two or three days in some centers. We try to get patients up and walking the afternoon after surgery, uh, if not certainly the next day, and uh, patients will also be able to get back to a regular diet fairly quickly. We leave a catheter in for seven days unless there's some special circumstances. I think anything longer than seven days on a routine basis is, is, uh, is unnecessary and, and it, it does cause the patient discomfort, so I think it is important to try and get the catheter out relatively early. Uh, and we ask patients not to do any major activities for six weeks to allow the incisions to heal. Surgery, of course, any surgery we do is, is, uh, can be associated with complications. And here I've just highlighted a few of them. So radical prostatectomy has traditionally been a fairly bloody operation, but uh, not with current techniques. So the, the need for transfusion is relatively low, um, should be less than 10%, usually less, less than 5%. Uh, getting a blood clot in the leg, so a, a, a deep uh, vein thrombosis, is always a possibility. And we will actually give patients a blood thinner to go home with after surgery to prevent this. A lymphocele is something very, very um, specific to this type of surgery where we remove lymph nodes in the pelvis for higher risk disease. And then you can get a lymph leak with a fluid collection that can put pressure on the vein. Uh, occasionally, this would re require a drain. And then a urine leak, so we, if we sew the bladder and urethra together and there's a little bit of gap, a, a little bit of a gap, then urine can leak out uh, through that gap. And that gap has to heal through scar formation, which can cause narrowing of the bladder neck. So these are things just, just to uh, put it out there that patients understand that it's, uh, surgery is not without risk of complications, although most patients uh, will not experience any of these issues. 
just wanted to mention the salvage prostatectomy. So this is the same operation. Uh, it's a radical prostatectomy, but it's done after radiation or other local therapy like, like HIFU or some of these energy-based therapies. The issues with salvage prostatectomy are, first of all, if a patient has a rising PSA after radiation, it's sometimes difficult to demonstrate that the cancer is only in the prostate, which requires a biopsy, and it's not elsewhere uh, on bone scan or CT scan. It is also problematic because the radiation causes a lot of scarring, so the surgery is a lot more difficult and the risk of complications increases. You also have to remember that the patient picked radiation over surgery in the first place, so there's generally a hesitancy, and ultimately we don't do a lot of salvage prostatectomies. In the post-operative recovery, uh, Kegel exercises are important. I won't go into detail, but it's often good even if patients learn about this beforehand. And then sexual rehabilitation is also important. There is a, a use it or lose it physiology to the penis. If there are no spontaneous erections, they, then the patient's not having that increased blood flow with increased oxygen levels, which will lead to damage of some of the important components of the erections, the smooth muscle, the nerves, the blood vessel linings. And so we think it is important for patients to proactively start using uh, the pills, the pumps, the, the, vacu or the uh, injections, it's supposed to say, actually on the slide to help get erections back again. And then let me just finish off talking a little bit about uh, treatment options beyond the radical prostatectomy. Uh, so one of the, the milestones in the, in the course after prostatectomy is first of all to sit down and review the pathology report of the prostatectomy. And this shows us not only the Gleason grade, which sometimes will change between the biopsy and surgery, it also shows us if We've left cancer at the edge of the specimen, so you can see here, cancer at the edge implies there's cancer left behind. Uh, it can imply that, it doesn't have to. It also shows us if the cancer limits the prostate, so the prostate here is in red, and you can see the, the black or gray tumor extending beyond the margin, so extraprostatic extension or into the seminal vesicle. And then if we've removed lymph nodes, we can see if the lymph nodes are involved, and each one of these is a, an important piece of information. Now, one of the, the adjuvant treatments we have is radiation. So if a patient has either cancer in the margin, extraprostatic extension, or some of vesicle involvement, then radiation becomes an option. And it's typically uh, over approximately six to eight weeks. It can be around 66 gray, which is just the dose. So it's multiple short treatments. And the alternative, though, is to watch the PSA and treat only if the PSA uh, comes up above a level of 0.2, which we define as, as the level of recurrence. And I'll come back to this in a second. The other adjuvant treatment we have is to give hormone therapy or androgen deprivation therapy. And this we consider in patients who have lymph nodes involved at the time of radical prostatectomy. And these patients, we will give them an injection of the, uh, the medication. They're called LHRH agonist or antagonist, which will suppress the testosterone production and um, the, the tumor needs testosterone to grow, or the cancer cells need testosterone to grow, so they will, they will um, disappear. This is given every, typically every three months, but between every one to six months. It's based on only one small study, so not everybody believes in this. And more commonly now, we don't just give continuous hormone therapy, we give it in a stop and start fashion. We call it intermittent androgen deprivation therapy. So sometimes we wait until the PSA reaches a level of approximately five after surgery before we would start this. Just a word on uh, PSA. We use very sensitive PSAs after prostatectomy. We expect the PSA to be essentially zero, although the test will never say zero. It'll say less than the lowest threshold of the test, uh, which would often be 0 0.01. And then if it reaches 0.2 or higher, we consider that a recurrence and we start thinking about other treatment choices. And we often don't see anything on imaging. This gives us an extremely early warning that we don't have with any other cancer. And so we can consider something like salvage radiation at a very early time point, and it's likely to be beneficial. So just my last slide here, I'd like to highlight five, five things for you as take home messages. Uh, first of all, the treatment decision around surgery versus radiation versus other is a very difficult one, but you should rest assured that there's no wrong choice. Um, you'll likely to do well uh, with whichever choice you make. 
I think for radical prostatectomy, the, the how is more important than the, sorry, the who is more important than the how. So it doesn't matter so much if it's robotic or open. It's more important that you have a surgeon that you have a good relationship with and that that surgeon is experienced in this operation. I think it's important for the patient and the patient's family and friends and partners to arm themselves with as much information as possible um, so they're very comfortable with their decision mm -hmm. and they know what to expect. And then for recovery, it is an active process. You need to, to know again what to expect and, and need to have a plan for Kegel exercises, sexual rehabilitation, and uh, monitoring your PSA. And then finally, I find that a lot of patients, if they're facing radiation after surgery, they're, they can be a little bit uh, defeatist, but I think this is one of the advantages where we can conventionally uh, potentially combine both for, for the best possible outcome. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you so much, Dr. Black. And at this time, I would like to remind our viewers that if you're looking for further information regarding prostate cancer care, please visit our website where you can download and order various resources. Please note there are also resources attached to this webinar on the bottom right of your screen. And if you're interested in viewing more webinars, please visit prostatecancer.ca slash expert angle. And once again, thank you, Dr. Black. This now concludes today's presentation, and we thank you all for joining.